some kind of stuff on my glasses. I don't know what it is. Oh, good evening and welcome to Having a Drink with Mink. I'm your host, Jason Mink. Thank you for joining us on the first episode of 2023. That's right. It's a brand new year. And, uh, well, let's hope it's a little bit better than the last one. You know what I'm saying? I think you do. All right, let's get to it because, as you can see, a bunch of crap on the desk. Might as well start talking about it now rather than later because, uh, from what I understand, there's only so much battery power. And we begin with the $6 million man. That is right. Colonel Steve Austin, he uh, boarded an experimental rocket plane and, uh, well, it flew really well. It just didn't land so good. And uh, in the process, uh, Steve, he took a little bit of damage, but not to worry, because apparently the U.S. government, well, they allocated six million of your taxpayer dollars to fix this guy up. Uh, that was the backstory of the six million dollar man television show. Uh, Steve Austin was also known as the Bionic Man, played by Lee Majors. Uh, the television show was a smash success. I remember all my friends and I were obsessed uh, with it, at least until Star Wars came along. And uh, Kenner produced this wonderful action figure. Now, as you can tell, he is a good bit bigger than your standard Mego, which is uh, usually what we measure figures against on this channel. We'll use uh, Woody Harrelson here. Now, <laughs> I asked him before the show uh, what this outfit was. He usually has some kind of riff on the, you know, outfit that our uh, main toy is wearing. Uh, this is uh, the Six Million Dollar Man, and uh, from what Woody tells me, uh, this thing on his uh, crotch here is an IOU for seven dollars. So. Some of the costumes aren't as good as the others, but as you can see, uh, this is an 8-inch figure. Lee here, he's a big 13 inches, and uh, what an action figure he was. He wasn't just a big old doll, but he had some fantastic features. Uh, we'll start at the beginning, uh, right at the top here, and that is his bionic eye. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're probably wondering if you've never seen this before, uh, what the heck happened here? Well, this was meant to represent his bionic vision. And uh, a kid could uh, stick their own eye against the back of his head and get, you know, sort of a very fisheye lens, you know, simulating uh, the bionic vision that you would expect. Now, uh, my good pal, friend of the show, Dave Edwards, as a little kid, uh, apparently... He didn't have a pair of toy binoculars, so what he did was he ripped the heads off of a couple of uh, bionic men and ran around with them over his eyes as if they were a pair of binoculars. And uh, yeah, I always thought that was the most wonderful story ever. I figured I would share that with you here. Seemed like the appropriate time. But uh, as you can see, Six Million Dollar Man, he does have that bionic eye. In addition to that, he has this uh, bionic feature. Um, the original figure came with an engine block. Ho oh, ho, sounds like a lot of fun, right? Well, the whole point was that he was able to lift the engine block. Now, initially, when I bought this figure, it was sold uh, with the idea that it didn't work. Well, that's not exactly true. You see, on the back is a button. And when you press the button and his head is straight forward, not a whole lot happens, really. Ah, the secret is... If you look to your left, well, that's when the magic begins. We don't have an engine block, so we're going to substitute this very heavy object right here in its place. And uh, to illustrate your $6 million worth, here he goes, using his bionic powers. <laughs> okay. It's a little slow as far as an action feature goes, but nonetheless, it was a pretty cool way to demonstrate uh, just how powerful this fella was. Hey, that works too, actually. <laughs> but, uh, get this thing out of here. 
but uh, flip his head around. Now, as you can see, uh, Steve, he's seen better days. The original figure, Larry, can we get a nice picture of the original? The original figure, uh, the costume was a uh, much nicer Nick. He had a iron-on patch right there with his own face on it, you know, lest you not realize who you were talking to, um, as well as a pair of socks, and we've seen this sock in a previous video where I horrified my brother with it, and uh, shoes. But uh, Steve, well, he got no shoes, I'm afraid. That's uh, definitely something that I'm going to have to pick up to finish my figure. In addition to that, underneath these clothes, uh, Steve comes with a few bionic modules. That was always my favorite part of this guy when it came right down to it. I thought it was incredibly neat to be able to roll up his arm skin and uh, reveal his bionics uh, just waiting inside. Um, Unfortunately, much like your lucky condom, the latex of the arm skin has long deteriorated and, uh, well, certainly isn't worth featuring here. But that is uh, one of the latest additions to the collection, and that is my Steve Austin figure. Yeah, he's vintage. Oh, he don't sit up so good. <laughs> Come on, Steve. You can do it. All right. Well, I hope you have a nice beverage on hand. I know that I do, as always. We're going to get right into the old comics, specifically Coverless Cuties. And um, you may have noticed Coverless Cuties is trending on the old guys who like old comics page. And that's because, uh, well, people are really starting to come around to uh, appreciating what uh, value those old coverless comics can actually present. If you don't believe me, well, stay tuned, and, uh, you know, I'll make my shoddy little case. <laughs> We're going to begin with Giant Batman. And uh, some collectors, right off the bat, they would turn their nose up at this because not only does it not have a front cover, it don't even got no back cover. No, sir. But what it do have, oh, it has stories, and we begin with the 1,000 Secrets of the Batcave. And um, as we can see, two of the 1,000 uh, Secrets are represented in the form of the Giant Dinosaur and the Giant Penny, both of which are featured here. Now, uh, yeah, it is coming apart down at the bottom there. I'll fix it after this video for sure. But uh, not only do you get that story, but you get others like The Birth of the Bat Plane 2, because apparently uh, the first one was putting mothballs after Batman machine gunned that guy uh, while flying around in it. You know, not good for PR. Then there's The Secret of the Bat Cave 68, which uh, I want to make a point to show you. I think I have that earmarked as well. There we go. Secrets of the Bat Cave 68. And, uh... This was shortly before Batman would move out. He went to the big city, don't you know? He set up in the Wayne Foundation building and had a new headquarters. But uh, this is what things were like back in those halcyon days. Not only that, but we also get a look at Batman and Robin's utility belts, the Batplane 68, and even Batman's special gas mask. That's right, when Robin had enchiladas the day before. <laughs> okay, and then here is the amazing Spider-Man and the coming of the kangaroo. Yeah, not all of Spidey's rogues were uh, incredibly successful right out of the gate. But uh, this one is notable, this particular issue. This is, uh, what does it say here, number 81. And it has artwork by John Buscema, Jim Mooney, John Romita, and... Artie Simak. So that is a power-packed presentation, and uh, this one is particularly notable for this legendary scene where Aunt May checks in on an allegedly sick Peter in his bed, finds a webbing dummy, which he had placed there so he can go out and play Spider-Man, and uh, she completely loses it, as you would expect. And she blacks out, passes out on the bed, and I think is hospitalized that point on leading Pete to need to take more pictures of himself as Spider-Man to make more money to pay for more medication for Aunt May, who, uh, you know, it's just a cycle is what it is. Then 
we have an issue. This is Tales to Astonish, number 72. This one's pretty interesting in that uh, ordinarily the book would be split between Submariner and, at this point, the Hulk. But uh, this one is all subby. I guess uh, they really wanted to make a uh, point to get the story done here. And uh, this is subby, and he's searching for the uh, trident of... Neptune, believe it or not. No less than Neptune himself. And then you also get some ads for the Mary Marvel uh, bullpen. You get yourself a Hulk t-shirt or some Marvel stationery. And then, because who says this isn't the Marvel age of the hard sell on the back, even more good stuff in the form of some t-shirts. Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, Hulk, Sergeant Fury, and even Cap's kooky quartet. Gotta love it. And then, what do we have? It's Dark Shadows, The Bride of Barnabas Collins, and The Mists of Time. And uh, I like these. I tend to pick them up when I find them on the cheap, and a uh, few comics are cheaper than cover lists. And uh, my thing is, I just want to read them. I'm not the biggest Dark Shadows fan in the world, but uh, the comics are definitely entertaining. And this one is extra entertaining because it's got a 16-page featurette uh, talking about all the toys that will be available this Christmas, 1969, I guess. I like this one. I wanted to point it out. It's uh, Adventures with Gabingale, the doll that says everything you tell her to say. And I guess it has some very uh, primitive sampling technology in there. But uh, dig this. Mr. Schultz, the butcher, will fool him too. Guten Morgen, Herr Schultz. Act lieber, a German doll! That's right. And as you can see, he's, uh, you know, dropping his bratwurst. So, you know, don't go pranking the, uh, you know, local butcher. He has it hard enough uh, acclimating to America in the... Uh, post-war climate here we have blues for a tired songbird and uh, you're wondering why the frame is black as opposed to your standard comic book color well this was a technique that was uh, allegedly intended to replicate the 3d experience without those pesky glasses absolutely and uh, how well does it work i don't know it's all right Probably wasted a lot of black ink, would be my guess. Uh, and they don't do it anymore, so what does that tell you? Speaking of footnotes, some of these ads are really something. Absolutely. But I guess, uh, you know, you're going to want to improve yourself after sitting around reading a comic book. Probably eating bonbons, you know. They were all the rage at the time. Next up, in his bid to address the housing crisis, Plastic Man takes matters into his own hands. And shoulders and you know all the bits really when it comes right down to it and what goes on inside well nothing less than will eisner's the spirit as well as dewey drip we even have a text feature ransom for woozy and uh, those text features existed solely so comic books could actually get a cheaper rate in the mail. Interestingly enough, if they had a couple text pages, they qualified for that. And then we have Candy. And here's a very uh, politically incorrect cartoon from back in the day. Harkens back to uh, this, in fact. And we have some more Plastic Man. You bet. This is a slightly later issue, as evidenced by the cover, but quite striking image. And this one also has the spirit <laughs> and Manhunter. And uh, this guy, very staid as far as uh, superheroes go. Very understated. Apparently they only had one color left at the shop but uh, nonetheless he's making it work for himself i mean he does have a feature in the comic book after all next up we have some pre-code crime in the form of justice traps the guilty this guy he's always a cop even when he's in his underwear yep still a cop and uh what i thought was interesting about these is these Pre-code crime comics, say that ten times fast, uh, 
or actually the gateway into more horrific stuff uh, as far as it goes. Horror comics were on the upswing uh, when crime was uh, sort of waning, and you can see the two genres intersecting here. It's the moment of decision. And then, speaking of decisions, you remember when Steve Ditko left Marvel back in the day? Uh, the first time, in fact. That's right. He walked away from Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. What did he go on to do? Well, nothing less than the Blue Beetle. And this is Blue Beetle number four. And uh, we have the Men of the Mask here. Blue Beetle going up against some sinister masked organization pretty nifty and then not only that but you also get this backup of the question you bet back before he was a dc character the question was featured in these charlton comics and then it's arizona reigns you betcha stampede under the trampling hooves of murder I'm guessing that red shirt that you're wearing, you know, not doing you any favors. But uh, I quite like these old westerns because they're so incredibly colorful. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, no, wait. Colorful was the other one I have marked. I have this one uh, set aside because it's got a lady in her underwear. <laughs> I guess I better be honest with you. I could have played that off, but, you know, let's be real. That's what it's all about. I was talking about sexy cowgirls in a previous episode, and, uh, wow, you don't really get much sexier than uh, this gal in her slip there going underwater to uh, thwart these criminals. So, yeah, it's Arizona Reigns. Who? I want to get her number. Yes, I do. And then on the back, amazing. Get acquainted with our tulip offer. You bet that's a hundred uh, bulbs for only a dollar sixty nine. Spring is right around the corner, and uh, you know if you're into showing off in a more manly way, well, how about hot rods? You bet. Uh, here we have some hot rods in the form of Charlton's. Uh, what is this one? Who can say? There were so many uh, Charlton hot rod comics, but this one uh, it's talking about the day of glory. There, yes, it is. Oh, <laughs> here we have a race on ice. That's right. Uh, Charlton would find a way to uh, make a story about just about anything. If they had six pages to fill, well, you know, they would uh, probably take your ideas as well. And this one is all about some uh, guys. Uh, the first page, mostly devoted to this fella slipping and falling on his ass, but I assume it gets more exciting. And then we have some adventures into the unknown from American Comics Group. These are always a kick in the head. American Comics Group, probably best known for bringing you Herbie. But they also had some uh, off-the-wall superheroes. Here we have Nemesis, and he's tackling no less than Hitler himself. Hitler, probably one of the most popular comic book characters of all time. Who would have seen that coming? Not Mrs. Hitler, I'll bet. And then here's the squad that had to get through. You betcha. This is an Atlas. Oh, yeah. Pre-code Marvel. Some war comics. Very arresting color design there, compositionally. Incredibly immersive. And then what do we have picked out to show you? Oh, yeah. It could have been a war story. It could have been, you know, like an awesome panel of a tank or a plane. But I wanted to show you this instead. Love is having someone who's willing to vacuum text the blackheads off your neck. That's right. Back in the day, there was this little suction device that uh, someone would come along and they could stick on you. You could stick on yourself if you have no love. And, uh,. <laughs> Suck out all the crud inside your veins, which I assume would leave you covered in gigantic red pores. But, you know, I guess it's better than tiny black spots. Or is it? Let me know in the comments section below. Then here we have Beware of the Big Shooter. That's right, uh, Jim Shooter. Well, he was notorious for... Oh, wait, no, apparently this is another one of those hot rod comics. But uh, Jim Shooter, he was notorious. And uh, what goes on here? 200 plus. 
these are often uh, fairly uninspired when it comes right down to it. But uh, every once in a while, you'll get a kick in the head. Harry Harry here, he manages to pull it out and win the race. And uh, when his gal comes to see him, well, he pulls a prank on her in the form of a missing front tooth. It was the 60s, you know, things were uh, different as far as humor went. Then here's Conga. Speaking of Steve Ditko, uh, this is Steve's adaptation of Conga. Very exciting. And not only that, this thing is chock full of Steve Ditko monster stories. We've got the Mountain Monster. We also have no less than... Oh, what the heck is this thing's name? I always forget. It's Gorgo. Take that. My personal favorite from this issue, this guy right here. I mean, holy smoke and Joe in the morning. What an image. You betcha. That's Steve Ditko. Definitely had his finger on uh, some kind of wild energy. And uh, it's with the help of Hogar. So... These are dynamite, and uh, if you plunk around, you can actually find these fairly easily. These stories were reprinted a number of times by Charlton. So get yourself a copy soon. And then here we have some Star Trek. These are those old goal key Star Treks from back in the day. And uh, this story is notable for uh, the crew of the Enterprise being Turn to Children! Oh my! And, uh,. Speaking of children, here at the back, here's a useful guide for your future. That's right. You can either be a cosmetologist or an air traffic controller. That's it. You got two choices, kid. Choose wisely. And then, uh, did I talk about Dark Shadows? I think maybe I mentioned that way at the front. Yeah, I'm not sure why this is way at the back, but here's another issue of Dark Shadows. This is, I think, number uh, 20. And uh, you'll notice on the back there, Dark Shadows poster I found in one of these. So once again, those covers, they can hide some uh, pretty impressive little features. And then on the inside, it's Quentin the Vampire. That's right, Quentin the Vampire turns into a werewolf. He's a double threat. If only he could get his witchcraft game under control, why, I think he'd have all the pieces on the chessboard. And then, here we have a couple interesting little giveaways, starting with Meet the Meadow Golds. That is right, it's Meadow Gold Milk. You know it, you love it, and uh, here it is to indoctrinate your children. And uh, what I found incredibly fascinating about this, the work of Mart Nordell. That's right, you know him as the creator of the Golden Age Green Lantern. And uh, here he is uh, pitching you on sentient milk <laughs> coming your way. Well, there's all kinds of fine milk products that you can work into your lifestyle. And then here's some uh, Warfront. And I'm not really a big war comics guy, but these often have some pretty eye-popping artwork. As I said, I really like the colors on these quite often. And then... It was an ad for something I've never seen before. You get over 70 action-packed spaceships, flying saucers, rockets, and men from Mars. That's right. They go out at night eating cars. Cadillacs and Subarus and whatnot. And then on the back, it's a barrel of fun. You betcha. You get the barbershop, the complete joke book, the complete traveling salesman joke book, the Army-Navy joke book. You'll have them in stitches. That's right. Or at least, you know, wearing wood. And uh, if that wasn't enough for you, you get yourself seven mystery novels all for a buck. Check out this gal. Oh, yeah, she's bad news. You're going to want to steer clear of her, fellas. And then... Here's some of that pre-code horror that I love so much. Featuring the gateway to death. You cannot escape, Richard Kahn. Come, you have delayed us too long. Ha 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 ha. And then check out Granny here. <laughs> oh yeah, you gotta love an enthusiastic corpse. I know I do. But then uh, 
on the inside here. <laughs> Hello, my name is I. Three weeks made Sad Jim Slim hep. How? Well, he sent this coupon in to Joe Bonobo. That's right. Uh, no, he's not a monkey. He's actually a uh, athletic uh, fella. Yes, he is, and he'll teach you how to get athletic. He'll teach you how to look sporty enough to wear the Chevalier. Makes a nice capper for this episode of Having a Drink with Mink. It's the first one of the year. Oh, but it won't be the last. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jason Mink, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.